Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Yes, so, so for our workshop, it was around the ongoing project that European Schoolnet are doing alongside Tactical Tech, uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, and Save the Children Italia. And it's called Media Literacy Case for Educators. So we started the session by providing a broad overview of the work that's happened so far in year one of the project, and that included a number of co-development sessions with key stakeholders from uh, teachers to other types of educators to librarians and of course really importantly young people themselves as well in terms of uh, attitudes and approaches to media literacy education and the aim of the project is to produce a number of resources but also champion um, media literacy advocates in the form of teachers uh, around Europe to be able to help facilitate media literacy teaching to, to children and young people. Um, the resources that we're developing will take the form of a number of posters that uh, run alongside uh, various interactive activities and other materials that educators can use to help young people to understand key media literacy issues. Um, those kind of issues include things around AI, which has very much been a theme of many of the discussions today, so looking at algorithms and large language models. Um, other topics included are things such as persuasive design or dark patterns in gaming, um, young people's relationships with technology in terms of well-being, but also the, the materiality of the internet as well, the, the physical uh, costs associated with producing technology, with uh, upkeeping technology, with human labor costs that are very much hidden in many cases, um, and also the materiality of how the internet works in that it isn't all up in the cloud, it's, it's cables under the sea in many cases. So, so those resources um, we just spoke about briefly. We ought to talk, also talked about an upcoming MOOC that will take place in 2024 to allow educators to learn more about this area and different approaches. And then we threw the floor open to everyone taking part in the session to think about the skills and qualities that both young people and educators need to be media literate in all its forms. And as you've probably gathered from all the sessions we've had today so far, it's a complicated area, a complex system of, of different systems, of ecosystems, if you like, that exist around young people, both online and through technology and through society as well. So we, we try to just narrow it down by thinking about those, those skills and those qualities. And as you can see from the, the slide here, three takeaway points out of many that were discussed and were recorded on um, the, uh, the sheets that we asked people to stick notes onto. The first one was um, we asked groups to work on skills and qualities for young people and then switch and work on skills and qualities for educators. But despite that, there was quite a lot of similarity across those two groups, which highlighted that the skills that we need to imbue in, in young people are very much the skills that everyone needs to be media literate um, in all its forms. And of course, educators need to possess those skills in able to be order to deliver that education and open up those opportunities for young people too. So that was the first thing, is that many of the skills are very similar regardless of your age. Um, second thing, and this is a really good point that uh, the Nori made actually, uh, talking about the importance of educators to work from a position of positivity around media literacy. It's very easy to put media literacy in with online safety and have discussions talking about the risks online and the things that can go wrong and how you can be affected when actually uh, taking a stance of positivity around these things is often a way to, to get young people more enthusiastic, to open up their minds and open up the discussions around these important topics as well. And then thirdly, we talked about a mixture of, of things such as technical skills, so knowing how to excuse me, <clears throat> knowing how to find different sources of information, knowing how to use various tools online to fact check or validate information, but actually softer skills play a key part in this as well in terms of social and emotional learning, understanding how to regulate your emotions in situations where you're presented with something that may uh, elicit a very strong emotion, but also recognizing that, that other people's behaviors and actions feed into the content that you see and have to make judgments on online. And, and someone in one group made a really good point about how increasingly on social media, we're being drip fed content, sometimes by algorithms. So we're kind of seeing the things we want to see or that it knows we're interested in or that we like, but we're ending up with very sort of small snippets of information in bite sized chunks. Um, and what young people really need are the skills to be able to put those pieces back together. So this idea that, that almost maybe you're getting like pieces of a jigsaw, but it's up to the young people themselves to assemble that jigsaw to get the bigger picture around an issue in order to make judgments and make decisions. And I thought that was a really good point as well. And uh, here's some of the, uh, the things that took place in the session. So we started hearing from all the partners at the start. 
And then the breakout activity was to write all these skills and qualities down onto various sheets of paper using the little post-it notes. And we've collected all of those to examine further later. And that was our session. So I'm gonna hand you over to Ben to talk about his session. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so our session was uh, about uh, digital competences, uh, and in particular, we focused on Europe Code Week, but not only. And we um, especially focused on uh, computational thinking skills uh, and the way in which computational thinking uh, can be uh, promoted at school. Uh, and uh, we tried to figure out uh, which are the gaps uh, that uh, need to be, to be overcome uh, and possibly to uh, find uh, um, solutions or uh, ideas uh, to try to overcome them. So at, at the beginning, we started presenting results about Code Week. And uh, in particular, the results of a study that demonstrates uh, uh, that Code Week uh, uh, resulted to be effective uh, in uh, engaging uh, especially teachers and schools, in particular in those countries uh, where uh, uh, the socioeconomic conditions uh, were uh, uh, more difficult, demonstrated that uh, as a grassroots campaign, uh, it was perceived as an opportunity where it was uh, more needed uh, and uh, it uh, could uh, had a bigger impact. And that, uh, in fact, what happened because uh, there is uh, a very uh, high negative correlation between uh, the penetration of code weak in countries uh, and uh, their uh, socioeconomic development. So this demonstrates on one hand, this was just uh, to set the scene uh, and uh, to demonstrate that there are gaps uh, that computational thinking skills uh, are uh, strongly related with diversity uh, across countries, uh, across regions within the same country, and even uh, within a city, uh, if we look at the cadastral value of houses, we still find the same path. So starting from uh, this uh, result, which is uh, provided by data, we engaged the audience uh, in uh, trying to figure out uh, which are the other kinds of gaps uh, that uh, need to be taken into account. Uh, and we found out that uh, teachers' involvement uh, issues uh, are uh, one of the concerns uh, that uh, came out. Uh, policy and curricula and enforcement uh, of uh, in compulsory education was uh, one other uh, driving factor and uh, possible gap that was, uh, that was considered, then uh, the digital divide, uh, especially in schools, uh, intended both uh, as uh, an um, infrastructure digital divide, the cultural digital divide, uh, and uh, also the opportunity of schools uh, of uh, having access uh, to uh, digital equipment uh, and possibly being uh, aware of the importance and of the potential of the equipment that they have, which is non-trivial because it is not sufficient to have digital devices if they are not uh, uh, properly used, and then gender gap. So uh, originally we had uh, five tables, uh, then they became three tables, uh, and the three tables uh, decided to work on the first three of the, um, of the issues that I mentioned. So teacher involvement, uh, policy and uh, curricula development, uh, and then uh, uh, digital divide. But then uh, the table uh, focusing on digital divide uh, also uh, took into account the gender gap. And uh, what uh, we found is that uh, the um, mainly, um, well, I would say, all uh, the tables, uh, even if they started addressing different concerns, uh, Focused uh, ended up focusing uh, on uh, uh, teachers' involvement. And the key role of teachers uh, came out uh, in uh, all the tables because uh, even the one focusing on policy um, came out by considering very important uh, the recognition uh, of the teacher effort uh, and the role of teachers uh, in uh, uh, bringing uh, computational thinking, uh, coding, and digital skills uh, in their uh, classrooms uh, and for their pupils. Uh, so uh, mm, as a matter of fact, where uh, uh, the um, digital skills 
are uh, not uh, uh, already in the curriculum, the role of teachers uh, um, is a driving factor that can uh, make a difference bottom up. And uh, what they need uh, is at least a recognition and the legitimation of what they do if uh, it is not mandatory. Then focusing on digital divide, once again, the importance of teacher's training uh, was uh, pointed out. And uh, while speaking about a gender gap, uh, one of the most important uh, things that came out uh, is the idea of uh, having uh, good role models uh, that are uh, as closer as possible uh, to reality. So not uh, too far role models uh, as uh, often uh, happens because uh, we um, often look for testimonials uh, who are uh, extraordinary while uh, we probably need normal people uh, who are uh, uh, good role models, uh, especially for girls. And when speaking about uh, gender gap, uh, one of the main issues that uh, was recognized by all the audience is that uh, this is uh, especially important in middle age, while in primary school it is uh, not uh, so an issue as it is uh, in middle and secondary school. So those uh, are the key findings uh, and the results uh, of the workshop uh, that uh, we had on, on this topic. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I think here are some impressions from your workshop. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I was running the workshop on the Continue Up project where we uh, explored ideas around strengthening the continuum between initial teacher education and continuous professional development so that we can uh, really get away from this idea of teaching as a destination but rather teaching as a journey so that you, uh, you don't enter the profession with the idea that you are now a fully formed teacher and you have full responsibility uh, as any other teacher who might have 15 or 20 years of experience. Uh, and we're trying to address that in this Continue Up project. So we started out by um, presenting and talking about the project, how we're approaching this issue and how we're aiming to strengthen that continuum. Um, and our main way of doing that is by bringing together ITE providers and CPD providers in the form of universities and mostly ministries of education and uh, co-creating and co-delivering uh, an ITE and CPD program. So thinking about both ITE and CPD together at the same time to ensure that there's a real strong continuum across um, um, that divide. Um, and in this program, we're focusing on developing teachers as digital lifelong learners. Uh, the project's only at the beginning. Uh, we only launched in June this year, so um, it's still early stages, but hopefully from this process we will learn something about how initial teacher education providers and CPD providers can better learn together, can better co-create programs together and even co-deliver them at some point. Um, we then broke up uh, into groups or where we discussed um, what are the obstacles uh, to a stronger continuum from ITE to CPD level, as well as some potential solutions. Um, in regards to obstacles, uh, things that were mentioned were the autonomy of higher education institutions who are often responsible for initial teacher education um, and with very few or limited guidelines that they are following in when they are designing their initial teacher education programs. Uh, on the other side, um, in many countries, the market for CPD is very diverse with very different actors involved which makes it um, very difficult to, to build uh, across that continuum. Um, <clears throat> and then, more generally, there are very few formal opportunities of exchange between these two uh, different sides. Of course, in some countries, it was also pointed out that the same organizations are responsible for both ITE and CPD, but it's not the case in, in all countries. And in those countries, there is very little opportunity for such an exchange or for even going beyond just an exchange, uh, something like a co-creation activity. Um, and then it was also mentioned that actually it's uh, impossible to talk about strength in a continuum if we're not even getting basics right, like um, incentives, the, the lack of incentives or recognition for continuous professional development activities. Um, and that we first need to address that. And more generally that uh, while this might be a nice initiative of trying to strengthen the continuum, uh, it's going to be impossible to achieve the kind of change where teachers are perceiving themselves as professional learners if they are entering education systems a bit more broadly that haven't changed over the last uh, 20, 30 years. 
Um, solutions that were pointed towards are, um, well, uh, the Continue Up project was given as a, as a good example of a potential solution because it brings together those two different sides. Um, the Continue Up project is an Erasmus Plus Teacher Academies project, a flagship initiative of the European Commission. So continuing these type of activities also at national level, um, finding policy mechanisms or funding to, to bring those two different sides together um, <coughs> would be one possible way to address this. Um, there was also mention of some ideas where initial teacher education providers, universities are directly funded to uh, offer a CPD, uh, which is also a good mechanism for the initial teacher education providers to stay up to date with what's happening in school, in the digital era, in, in the digital um, um, yeah, developments at school level and what is needed there. And there was the comment that sometimes uh, universities are actually lagging behind uh, what's happening in schools. Um, and then there was an idea of um, developing uh, joint standards and frameworks and uh, this was actually one of the key challenges in the Continue Up project is coming to an agreement about what kind of framework we should use and what standards to follow. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that was really one of the first uh, um, uh, stepping stones of trying to build that uh, joint program. So developing or engaging in that exercise of developing of joint standards and frameworks is already a good momentum and a good idea of bringing the two sides together uh, and setting the framework for co-creation and co-delivery to take place. There was also um, some ideas shared, uh, in particular from Belgium, about school-based learning communities um, where schools get uh, the opportunity or get funding to organize uh, moments where the, all the school comes together for joint learning activities and that these could also be moments where I, initial teacher education providers, universities are invited to, to participate. Um, Yes, and then a, a final point that was also raised um, is, well, if, we, if we, we, we need to address some of the basics, especially in regards to CPD, so need to make sure that there are more and better incentives for teachers to participate in CPD. Yes, so that was a quick summary of uh, what we engaged in in the Continue Up workshop, and here are some quick impressions. Okay. Uh, no, no. <laughs> The questions. I mean, we still have five minutes. We're not using these five minutes for questions. I mean, these three projects are extremely interesting. I mean, obviously, the ones who participated in the workshops could pose questions, but the other ones obviously couldn't. And uh, I mean, we talk about media literacy, coding, and well, computational thinking, and we're talking about you know continuing professional development and these key skills and key actions. Uh, if then, yes. Uh, a microphone is coming. We are digital. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the digital topic. So uh, my question is for Alessandra. Thank you for sharing and organize the, the talking today with uh, like the digital things. And uh, I have a question about like the COVID, talk COVID things in Europe is very successful. And in, um, um, and you who may be the only two person from China, and something happened in China is we are trying to do something like this kind of event act activity in the school. But in China, there is something that all the students, when they're going to the uni before they go to, going to the university, there is an exam that in the end of the high school. So this is like a, for every student in China, this is the most important exam. So if the coding or this kind of computation thinking is not in the exam, then this is not important. Or maybe for the, for the student and teacher, this is not a serious thing. But in some way, today, you know, in elementary school, the, a lot of teachers and parents, and even the government, promoting the idea that we need to learn in digital way. We need to learn in the way that using more technology things in the, in the classroom. But if the exam don't change, how can we change everything? We, try, we just change import, input, but we don't change the way to do exam, we don't change the way to doing review the performance of the outcome. So how do we think this, any solution for that? <laughs> Thank you. It's too simple, it's too simple question. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> So I'm, I'm afraid that I have no solution for that, but I'm, um, I appreciate the way in which you raised the, the question to our attention. Uh, and I think that this is a, 
not just uh, for me as a question, because it's probably related uh, to all the workshops that uh, we had uh, today. And, um, well, I think that there is a, a, um, a big issue, which is, uh, first of all, uh, the recognition of the importance of school as uh, um, the only uh, true way of making a change uh, which is uh, structural. It is not uh, just uh, uh, an attempt of filling a gap uh, because of the contingency. So uh, in order to change something, uh, we needed to see the school both as, a, as one of the, um, of the systems uh, that need to uh, be upskilled in order to take full advantage uh, of digital development, uh, but on the other hand uh, is uh, also the uh, only uh, true instrument that we have uh, in order to try not uh, to um, have new generation which uh, already have a gap uh, at the beginning because uh, of uh, the school of the curricula who are not uh, uh, still uh, in line. And uh, the idea of uh, uh, having this coherence uh, uh, between uh, the input and the output and the way in which uh, we, we feed the system and we evaluate the results is probably uh, something that uh, is uh, necessary uh, in order to take full advantage of the potential of the school system. But I have no idea on uh, how to achieve this uh, at the moment. What I, what I see is that uh, in, uh, in many countries and uh, in Italy as well, uh, the, um, there is uh, also um, a difficulty in recognizing that digital skills uh, are based uh, on computer science, which is something which seems uh, trivial, at least uh, to me it seems trivial because I'm a computer scientist, but if we don't recognize that digital skills are uh, and, and digital stuff is based on computer science, as we probably uh, keep um, basically um, raising uh, rather than narrowing uh, a gap. I don't know if there are other <laughs> answers. Not really. I can maybe just comment that I have the hope that we will soon see some changes in the way we organize assessment simply by the fact that we are forced because of the rise of generative AI. I think this will really require us to rethink the assessment processes. And maybe this is finally the moment where we will then actually see those changes happening. Yeah, both good points. I think the only thing I have to add in this area is, and, and given that we're here talking about digital skills, is that you know the aim of education usually is to prepare children and young people to enter the world and enter society as, as adults, productive adults, usually hopefully well-adjusted adults as well. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're trying to teach them digital skills uh, and other types of skills for occupations that don't even exist yet because they haven't been invented. So it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. It's trying to work out, well, what skills do they need for, for the workplace of the future when we don't even fully know what the workplace of the future is going to look like? And I think the, the countries and the governments that, that figure that out are, are probably going to be the most successful ones who get a handle on what type of skills they need to embed in the education system as children move through it. Yeah, which is probably why the, <clears throat> the, the most important skill is to learn and to learn, because at the end of the day, you know, if we don't do this. And another thing maybe is students' agency. And, and you know, yeah. teachers should and will, etc. But we all know that teachers may have a bit of a conservative risk. Sometimes students seem to be a bit more, hopefully, quick and Actually, they were born in, in this digital society, most of them. So probably you know, strengthening the students' agency might be one of the tools to go beyond this. When it comes to assessment, it's becoming tricky. I'm, I'm one of the ones who say assessment is overrated. But that's another conference. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's uh, <coughs> uh, okay. So uh, more questions? Yes. Can you hear me? Now, yes. Good. <laughs> All right. To follow up on this, uh, first of all, if you have, have high-tech high exams, like in China, uh, you actually have to change the content of the exams in order to make it important. Uh, unfortunately, we in Sweden don't have high-tech exams, so we have, don't have that problem. <coughs> but <coughs> we have problem uh, nevertheless, 
And one of them is <coughs> that when we talk of CPD, uh, it's easy to see uh, when we have this sort of more, more general approach as was presented by this project, uh, th that we can, we can uh, create something that has some kind of uh, uh, life expect expectancy, that, 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 that it could, we can make a MOOC and it will be okay for a year or two or three, perhaps, uh, we don't know. Uh, but but what we actually see is that there there is happening things uh, that makes it uh, urgent to get teachers upskilled. For example, 2017 we introduced programming and computer science into curricula. Uh, by the way, we have a very broad definition of digital competence. So it's so computer science is just one fourth of it, I would say. But uh, the <coughs> The thing is that then a lot of teachers suddenly uh, were expected to do uh, a lot that has to do with digital competence and it was written into the curricula so that it was a task for all teachers in schools. Uh, so then, then we had to try to supply online opportunities for, for CPD, otherwise it's not possible to get 150,000 or 200,000 teachers on board. But when we then, a couple of years later, this year, suddenly find that all those teachers must include AI into that digital competence, uh, how do you do that? Uh, <coughs> 2017, we had uh, more programming in, in specific subjects uh, then we could point out, these are the teachers that are subject for this, so we asked the universities to create courses that they can attend, and we paid for the courses, so it worked easily. But, but now when we have to sort of train all teachers in, to figure out how to, to, uh, to, how to handle AI and how to teach about AI, that is a challenge. That is very hard, and it has to be done very, very quick. Yeah. I don't know where I put the question mark, but somewhere. <laughs> that, sounds like, that sounds like a Ben question to me. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what the question actually was, but <laughs> um, maybe just to comment on, uh, I mean, one of the key focus areas of the Continue Up project is focusing on developing the capacity of teachers or the competences of teachers for professional learning for professional collaboration. And I think the only way, we will always be in situations where teachers will face a sudden change in technology or something like the COVID pandemic. Sorry, it's okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it will be impossible, or very difficult for us to offer a training at short notice um, and, and even to figure out what that training should be. And teachers are probably best at doing that themselves. Um, so if, we, if they have the capacity to collaborate, to communicate with each other, and to learn as a community of teachers, I think that's the powerful dynamic that we need to establish. And that's what the training that we organize um, needs to focus on. Yeah, I don't I know mean, if that answers your question, but. Uh, no, indeed. I mean, uh, that's something we do in many projects. I mean, peer learning is obviously, sorry, there was a sound which is becoming like in, in a rock concert. Uh, <laughs> Love to be Jimi Hendrix, but okay, thank you. So uh, peer learning and 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 communities is, is one of the things. I mean, we can't do it before maybe second year. I mean, that would be impossible. So that there must be somewhere, and you know, bottom up and peer learning is probably one of the solutions, which is a bit more agile, as in computing is the mantra. Uh, more questions? Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't prepared, it wasn't foreseen, but I think this is one of the things that we should exploit when it comes to these moments, and you will excuse. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. I think um, Georgi alluded to this this morning. The issue that we're seeing in a lot of countries with even ministers of education talking about the importance of de-digitalization and um, talking about health problems with young people conflating, I would consider, consumer technology issues with digital learning in schools and talking about screens being the reason that the PISA results dropped so much um, when they came out. I'd love to hear your perspective. How do we, how do we continue <coughs> having a conversation about what the value is and ensuring that p parents and senior leadership, particularly at political level, really listen? Good question. Um, I think one of the things that the pandemic did 
for everyone, more or less, parking digital divide and access to technology for a moment, is, is it threw away this whole notion of what screen time is? Although I don't, I'm not entirely sure, coming out of that, how many families and how, you know, how many different countries have, have fully taken that on board. But we went, went from a system of going, well, you, know, you shouldn't spend more than an hour, two hours doing this thing on a screen, to, well, you have to spend seven hours a day now on a screen because you're in lockdown and you have to communicate with family and friends via a screen now. And you have to do all your schoolwork via a screen. And when you want to entertain yourself because you're bored, it's via a screen. So we went from a real kind of shift there. And, and this whole notion of screen time and, and quantity got thrown out, um, which it should be, really, because it's, it's actually more about a, a matter of quality. It's about what are you doing when you're in front of that screen or what are you doing when you're engaged with that technology and, and what is the value to you? And, and there's good quality screen time and there's junk quality screen time, like binge watching stuff on TikTok or Netflix or YouTube. Um, so there, there are differences around that. And I think, I think that's still an ongoing discussion of sort of understanding the different natures of screen time uh, and what that kind of means in terms of skills. But it, but it is interesting that the different approaches to, to de-digitalization and uh, I, work for European Schoolnet, but I'm based in the UK, and, and around about the end of October, there was guidance issued from the Department for Education to all UK schools, secondary schools mainly, about the need to ban mobile phones in school, which most secondary schools have been doing in one form or another for about eight or nine years, so they kind of looked at this guidance and went, what? Because it, it wasn't anything new to them, but it was very much taking this stance that, that there shouldn't be this kind of technology in the classroom, and yet, as a result of emerging technologies and indeed you know, things that happened during the pandemic, we've come out the other side with increasingly lots of classrooms using QR codes, just like we've used in sessions today. You need a device to scan a QR code. If you're saying taking technology out of the classroom, how, how then can you, you kind of teach this responsible use and this practical positive use of those things? So I think there's some real, um, some real issues around trying to demarcate again this constant idea of technology or no technology or online or offline and I think the more that people persist with that notion the more you create this division and children just end up in the gap in the middle and they're not entirely sure what to do or how to go about doing things um, so yeah long answer short I didn't really answer your question now I think it's an ongoing discussion I think it's about having that discussion rather than going to one extreme or the other because at the end of the day the solution is somewhere in the middle if I may, uh, um, th th that's, that's a technical answer, I would say. There is a more fundamental answer, which is more, I mean, these people are being voted. The people are saying this. They also saying that there's no climate change, some of them. And so, I mean, uh, for me and for us, probably the, the answer is education. These people should not be voted, as simple as that. When we get there, then maybe we can talk to them or to the people who are voted. But until we are voting people that are you know, talking about the earth is flat and then we should ban computers and maybe should back to Middle Ages because you know, patriarchism is, is, is most important. I mean, guys, uh, really, uh, so education is the answer and is the answer. Then all the other things are, allow me, technicalities, I mean, screen, time, okay, fine, but it's something deeper, and that is where we're going to. And that is getting philosophical. So um, <laughs> I will close the questions and the answers. Thank you for your patience and for your support.